Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you're all uh, well fed and excited for the rest of the day. We have some very cool stuff coming up. Um, before we get into the next series of talks, we're going to do we're going to do the Slido thing again. I know that most of the people in the crowd are familiar with Slido, but the engagement and the questions that we've been getting from you have been great. I want to make sure that anyone on our live stream that is watching and is joining us a little bit later or is maybe in a different time zone also gets the down low on Slido so they can send in some more of those great questions remotely. So we're going to do another little Slido kind of icebreaker right now. To bring us back from this, I think, oh, I just dropped a bunch of stickers, stairs on stage. Um, Again, uh, you can go to slido.com and enter the code hashtag newharvest2022, or if you're here in the crowd, you can scan the QR code in the front of your packet. And the question we have on deck for this is, coming back from the first half a day of this conference, one word to describe your vibe right now. How are you feeling about the conversation so far? Um, so we're going to try to get that question up on the board and we're going to try to get some fun answers and a word cloud to that. Again, for folks watching at home, this is slido.com. Um, type in the code hashtag newharvest2022. So yeah, one word to describe the vibe, your vibe in particular. We have both encouraged, jazzed, and sobered. Someone said gassy. Sorry about that. <laughs> had a, had something a little weird at lunch. That's fine. That's fine. It happens to all of us. There's no need to be embarrassed. We're all friends here. Um, motivated. I love that. Grateful. Interested. Meaty. Somebody's feeling meaty. That's, that's a fun one. That's interesting. Um, amazing. These are great. I love, the I love that people are feeling inspired, energized, excited. I'm also energized and excited. Thank you so much for participating. Um, really excited to introduce our next speaker. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that has made this so, so energizing and so inspiring is sort of the, the speakers that we have uh, on deck today. And so our next talk is going to be about solving for safety. So you heard some of those concepts addressed in the previous panel, right? We talked a little bit about should we or should we not be using antibiotics, and how do we think about sterility and downstream processing, and there are several other safety considerations that we have to take into account when we're thinking about launching brand new products to market. And so we have to understand, right, how does that get evaluated, how does that get demonstrated? And our next speaker is going to be really great at introducing and talking us through some of those concepts. So I'm pleased to welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Kim Ong. Kim is a safety expert with Vireo Advisors. I said that right, right? Yeah, Vireo, OK. So she's an expert uh, with Vireo Advisors and helps companies navigate these regulatory and safety challenges. Every single company that you see up here today is going to have to navigate these conversations with regulators and with the public around the safety of their products. And so Kim is here to tell us a little bit more about how she thinks about that. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that lovely intro. And hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, so I am here to talk about safety. Yay! All right, we got some energy in here. Um, yeah, so uh, I am Kim. Um, I work with Vireo Advisors. And so we are a, um, a mission-driven consulting firm uh, that is dedicated to helping groups uh, innovate and create safe new products. So make sure you go to market safely um, and uh, keep your employees and the environment uh, safe and sound. So I myself, I'm a toxicologist, um, and I do help companies uh, work through safety strategies. So we work from right at the very beginning through an R&D to um, when you're going to commercial product, uh, and then once you're authorized to kind of help you make safe products continuing on from there. And uh, yeah, we work in the cultured meat space. Um, we also work in other novel ingredients uh, for food. We work in uh, food contact materials uh, and other consumer products. So things of uh, made from synthetic biology, bio-based materials, and, and also nanomaterials, um, which is where I started. 
So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the work that we've been doing with New Harvest um, to kind of work on some of these safety issues and kind of figure out what we need to work on. Um, and so uh, kind of touch on some of that and then also some of the safety issues that we've been hearing about um, through kind of our conversations with a number of folks. So uh, the first question, of course, that you all came here to learn about is, is cultured meat safe? Uh, yeah, OK, it's safe. Talk over. You can go home now. No, I'm just kidding. I am a toxicologist, and uh, I do believe that we can make these products safe. But of course, just like any other food, um, we need to think about uh, any uh, potential for contamination. We need to think about what can happen during manufacturing processes. Um, we need to make sure that the final product is safe. Um, and so we really want to be thinking about all the different um, components of safety. So um, what I really want to uh, emphasize here is uh, how important it is for us to kind of work together to make sure that these products are safe. Um, and so. Yeah, today is going to be a lot about collaboration, about opportunities here in the safety area to actually, um, yeah, think about the questions together and do some research. And I, I really truly believe, um, and what we really uh, like to do at Vireo, um, that's kind of outside of you know consulting inv individually with companies, is to collaborate with academics, researchers, um, gov uh, government scientists, and of course industry itself uh, to make sure these, these things go to market in a kind of efficient way uh, and so that we're all on the same page. And what I truly believe is that if we do uh, make these products safe, that my nieces um, will be going into the future eating a safe product. So that's kind of my motivation. I want them to have cultured meat as kind of a regular thing in their lives. And of course, I want to make sure that that is um, completely safe. So. What is the current paradigm? Currently, um, Leggy kind of pointed to this earlier, um, each company kind of works in their own silo. Um, we spend a lot of money to do testing, hiring experts, developing methods. Um, sometimes you do more tests than you even need to because you're not exactly sure what you're doing. Um, we're trying to find labs that are um, understanding what this product is. Uh, and so basically, we're kind of repeating and duplicating a lot of the efforts. Um, and of course, we're, we're kind of relying on a small set of experts e either within your team or the people that you're working with. And so what we want to do is we want to kind of uh, encourage folks to work together. So of course, if we work together, we can develop the methods together. We use fewer resources. Um, we use uh, less money. And, and then we also have the viewpoint of a lot of different, um, uh, coming from a lot of different experts, which I think will actually make the product safer. So. Um, in order to kind of encourage this, what we've been doing is uh, the safety initiative. So a lot of you may have actually heard about this initiative um, that Vario and uh, New Harvest, um, we kind of started this in 2020. And uh, the goal is to start um, galvanizing the industry and figuring out kind of where we can go. So we all started this because we realized there was a lack of publicly available information. Um, I think that's still quite true today, even though we know there's a lot of uh, safety research going on. Um, we don't really see any of that in the public domain. So we started with industry. Um, so uh, the folks at New Harvest used their amazing skills at convening and brought together um, over uh, 87 um, individuals from 50 different companies. Uh, and Isha talked to maybe all of them, I don't know, <laughs> uh, on one-on-one -on -one interviews to basically start us on the safety path and figure out kind of what the issues were. We had three workshops with these industry folks. Um, it was open to anyone um, who wanted to join. And we together uh, developed a uh, kind of roadmap about what kind of potential hazards could be out there. So we brought together everyone. Um, the first place we started was to kind of figure out what, in general, was the manufacturing process that we would be uh, looking at that represented about 80% of the industry as a whole. And as safety uh, assessors, we needed to know that because uh, we need to look at every single step of the manufacturing process um, to really understand where there could be hazards. So we did end up publishing um, an open access paper, which was very important um, to us and to, to New Harvest. So this is available to everyone. Uh, it contains a ton of details uh, about the workshop and then also what came out of there. Um, and so yeah, I encourage anyone who wants to get more details uh, at this point to, to access this paper. Um, but this is kind of uh, the figure that uh, I'll point you to. I'm not going to go through it in detail right now, because I will talk about uh, some aspects later on. But essentially, we did manage to come up with a generalized manufacturing process and kind of identify different hazards that occurred those different stages, which I think will help companies um, now, at this point, be able to at least kind of figure out how to more safely manufacture a product, uh, what kind of aspects you should be thinking about. 
uh, and so forth. But the exciting thing that's happening right now is we have moved on to Safety Initiative 2.0. Uh, so starting this year, um, we did start speaking to regulatory scientists. Um, so of course, regulatory scientists are really important to talk to because they're the ones who are ultimately going to authorize our products. Uh, and so we've been reaching out to them um, from a number of different jurisdictions to kind of uh, talk to them about their issues. Uh, now I know um, and I hope that there are lots of other safety initiatives kind of going on in other places um, uh, around the world. Uh, we know that folks are talking about uh, policy, um, some specific safety aspects, labeling, um, terminology, that kind of stuff, which I think all feeds into this. Uh, but what we're, we are really focusing on is what are the methods and ways we can analyze data in order to figure out how a project is safe? So kind of what are the steps, what are the methods that we need that everyone can use uh, in this room uh, in order to uh, assess safety and kind of make it a little faster for you when you're going through that process? So currently, um, uh, Virio, um, so Joanne Shatkin and myself at Virio and uh, Rick Kennedy at Neutral Science are doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with regulators. Um, so far, we've talked about uh, 12 folks from six different um, jurisdictions about regulatory science. Um, and uh, we plan on having a workshop for those regulators later this year. Uh, and we want to bring them all together in the same room and kind of really talk about what we need, what industry needs in order to know so that they can go through that regulatory process faster. Uh, we can get those kind of tests out there. So methods, specification development, research gaps, um, kind of galvanizing the, the research in this field. And importantly, of course, um, priming them for collaboration with, with um, the whole community as well. So. Uh, when we've been speaking to different uh, regulatory agencies and kind of also as we have been helping companies go through safety assessment, it kind of boils down to um, this twofold uh, assessment. The first is um, similarity. So how similar are uh, your cultured meat and seafood products to conventional products? Um, so things like nutritional testing, uh, looking at amino acid content, um, looking at the genetic similarity of your products. The next thing is, of course, assessing all the hazards. So this could be anything that's going into your product, um, byproducts, uh, and could also, of course, be anything uh, that is, is the residue, so something that would end up in your final product. So are those all safe? And ultimately, all we're trying to do right now is figure out what is different. So um, one, is it completely novel? Is it something that we've never seen in food? Is it something that maybe we've never eaten before? Two. Um, is it even present in the final food? So even if you're using something that's novel but doesn't end up in the final food, maybe it's like a processing aid uh, and maybe um, someone actually won't end up eating it. So that's a consideration. If it is in the final product, is it there at a higher or lower concentration than we normally see? How much will we actually eat of this food? So are you intending the food to kind of be... Um, across the world in supermarkets uh, where maybe vulnerable populations such as children may be eating your product or is it a target audience intended for like a, you know single single establishment in really small concentrations uh, we take that into consideration oh yeah and of course we take all these factors and we um, figure out how much we're eating whether or not there's any sort of hazards associated with it and we determine whether or not it's safe so what we really do is we kind of think about all these things that are different. And uh, right, right now I want to talk uh, pretty quickly about the different um, hazards that have been coming up in our different conversations. And of course, I will say that uh, more is still happening now as we kind of go through more regulators and talk to more folks. But uh, we do intend to have um, all the outcomes of those uh, regulatory conversations be a public uh, workshop or a public presentation and paper later on so that everyone knows all the things that are at the top of the list that we need to be working on. So the first thing, of course, is microbial contamination. Um, that's a pretty straightforward one. At this point, we do know that uh, contamination that occurs in uh, cell culture or it's going to be different than things that occur in livestock production, for example. Um, and we also, uh, as was alluded to earlier, there are a lot of ways already uh, that we learn from different industries uh, to kind of manage and control microbial contamination. So that may be looking at your cultures, looking for turbidity and, th and that sort of thing. Um, contamination in some ways is pretty self-limiting. Um, if you do get contamination, then you tend to have to throw away that whole batch and do a full cleaning. So um, not necessarily a major uh, concern. 
Uh, the one place where we do suggest for um, real uh, to make sure that you're testing for are from mycoplasma. Uh, they can be really sneaky. Um, we do know there are some reports that uh, some cell lines used in research, up to 35% of them are infected with mycoplasma, and they aren't necessarily detected by normal methods. Um, so we really do uh, suggest you look for those. Now, we know there's a lot of different sources of um, microbial contamination, and we have lots of different ways we can manage them. Um, and so we usually do end up with a quite sterile product. One of the interesting things uh, that have come up in some of our conversations with uh, regulators and different experts is thinking about actually having a sterile product. So theoretically, if you have a sterile product, you might have a longer shelf life. However, um, normally when you have a food, you actually have some sort of like microbiota. So you have a bunch of different organisms on your meat that are competing with each other and they don't tend to be harmful. What may happen is if you have a completely sterile product, if that gets infected with something that's harmful or pathogenic, it doesn't have anything to compete against. So you actually end up having something that has more harmful um, substances on it. So I think this is really a ripe area for research, uh, somewhere to think about. Um, I've heard about folks talking about inoculating potentially uh, the cultured products with um, kind of healthy microbiota. And so there's obviously some really cool avenues of research to be done here. Uh, the next thing, as we heard kind of in, a, 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 in the panel discussion earlier, are the concern for antimicrobials. Um, as was already alluded to, um, many companies have kind of um, uh, said that they're not going to use antimicrobials early on in, the, uh, in their process, and if they do, it would be very early on, so not likely to end up in their final product. Uh, there are already very standard methods to search for antimicrobials, so we should be able to very easily measure those. Um, but yeah, one of the concerns, of course, is um, antimicrobial resistance. So if we are going to be using uh, antibiotics throughout the whole process, we need to make sure that we are, are um, being responsible about it, that we're not uh, throwing it away in large concentrations and kind of tracking how much antimicrobials are in our products. Maybe comparing it to conventional livestock. Uh, one area of research are places where regulators may be looking at is setting um, standards for what kind of antimicrobials antimicro can be used and kind of what residue limits can be used. And uh, similar to conventional livestock, withdrawal times. So Okay, you can use them early on in your stage, but then early on in your process, but then later on you may have to wait quite a period before you can actually sell your product um, to make sure that you don't have any uh, residuals on those. Okay, so growth factors are uh, come up a lot as um, products that may potentially uh, uh, be harmful. So we know that growth factors uh, are likely to be used in uh, cell culture. They're absolutely essential to you know, cell growth and differentiation and proliferation and so forth. And the concern um, that we hear about growth factors is that um, in some studies, a high level or higher levels of growth factors circulating in our blood are sometimes associated or linked to certain types of cancer. So that's often where this stems from. Now, uh, what, we, what we do know about um, growth factors is that um, we ourselves actually naturally make growth factors. That's something that helps us be healthy and survive. Uh, and so we're not really sure how, where the link of growth factors that you consume is compared to um, those studies that find high levels of growth factors. We know that dietary preferences, so things like eating, uh, drinking milk, um, can actually increase growth factors. We know lifestyle changes can actually influence growth factors, and so that link isn't that clear. So there is a lot of contradictory evidence as to how that works. So in the, uh, in the, this is a case where there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think there is um, kind of an impetus in us to do some other things to look at these growth factors, uh, not kind of understanding exactly how that works. So what we need to do is one, um, figure out, are they even present in your final product? Two, figure out kind of what concentrations they're present in your product. Um, you can maybe be able to compare that to some other foods like milk that do contain growth factors already. Um, and I think the most important place where we need to do research is figuring out if uh, growth factors are actually still bioactive when you consume them. So by this, I mean uh, for growth factors are known to be quite um, unstable. And so we know if you heat them, as you will for, most, uh, for many of the foods, uh, they might actually just break down and they won't be active anyways. Uh, and also when you consume growth factors, um, we have a pretty harsh environment inside our bodies. Uh, it, there's like a high chance that these growth factors are gonna degrade. But again, um, we need this publicly available information so that everyone can use it and everyone doesn't need to keep repeating these experiments over and over. All right, so we know that culturing cells um, can cause, um, culture, the process of culturing cells and doubling and proliferating the cells 
um, will cause uh, mutations to occur. That's completely expected. Uh, we know that um, there are some uh, genetic engineering and genetic modification that is purposely being done in some processes. Uh, and so th really the main concern um, is whether or not these processes are producing new proteins. Um, are they producing nutrients, anti-nutrients, toxins? Are there off-target mutations? Basically, we need to figure out whether or not uh, there's any chance that these kind of new proteins will be made and whether they would have some sort of uh, food issues. Um, luckily, there are a really wide range of methods, a lot of omics, genomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, a uh, lot of different methods that we have to already approach this issue. What we do need further research in, though, is exactly how to use these, um, how to use these science, uh, these omics, how to do the analysis, and how we, um, how we can kind of interpret these results uh, in order to create safe foods. Because again, we can't do every single omics every single time we make a new batch of food. So yeah, really needing to kind of uh, narrow that down. Uh, I have a list of a, a few more things here that aren't necessarily things that are at the top of the list in terms of what we're hearing from the regulators and what we're hearing from other experts, but I do want to touch on them briefly just so uh, we're all on the same page. Uh, one, of course, is the health of the source animal. Um, <clears throat> you may get uh, contamination from the actual biopsy itself, but more uh, importantly is that uh, source animals, if they're not healthy, they may have viruses, so we need to be able to kind of detect those species-specific viruses. Um, so that's something, again, as long as you, uh, you know, um, you can easily test for those kind of things. We already have those methods. Um, one of the things that I hear is, um, are we eating cancerous cells? Um, so that's a thing that comes up pretty often. Um, it's an, a, valid, a valid question. Uh, so uh, we do know that um, in most cases we're immortalizing cells, which does mean that these cells are um, uh, duplicating for uh, kind of indefinitely, and so, um, yeah, some people may term this as cancerous, but what we do know, of course, is that in order for cells to continue to du duplicate and continue to um, uh, survive, is that they need like really specific media, they need really specific conditions in order to survive. Essentially, when you harvest a cell, um, you are, uh, we can kind of consider that we're eating dead cells, and there's not really much chance of them continuing to duplicate and survive. We know that when we consume them, much like meat, we're breaking them down into kind of the constituent um, uh, amino acids and so forth. And so uh, at this point, there's no compelling evidence to say that these um, cells are going to be, continue to be cancerous uh, in your body. And then, of course, finally, uh, we need to think about all the different inputs. There's lots of new things that are kind of coming down the pipeline. Um, one of the areas where I'm hearing one of the most challenges that manufacturers are having is that they're not exactly sure what's going into their product because a lot of the uh, media has a lot of IP surrounding it. So I think that this is one of the things that as a um, community we need to work on. Um, so of course uh, media producers may want to maintain the um, kind of the IP of their actual product. And so what we need to do is we need to figure out, okay, is there like a way we can have a list of maybe safe substances that can go into the, into the media? Um, or is there uh, some methods we can develop for these media producers in order to kind of test their product and certify? And, and so when they give us, give us these, uh, when they give the manufacturers the products, we know that we are using something safe, even if we don't know every single thing that's inside of it. So some different approaches we need to think about here. So what is already established? Um, as kind of mentioned, we have pretty set methods already to do test similarity, um, to test for the different residues, and to test for um, the different inputs. Um, yeah, those are pretty straightforward. Uh, of course, we have uh, lots of different places to pull from in order to understand microbiological contamination. Uh, we know uh, from the meat field, we know from cell culture testing, and of course from livestock testing, there's lots of different methods already there. So what? What do we not know, um, again, is kind of how to interpret these results. So what exactly, what kind of um, similarity uh, do we need in order to be assured that it is uh, similar to other meats and that they would have the same kind of long-term effects? Uh, we need to understand um, what kind of residues, uh, what kind of levels of residues are acceptable in products. And I think that one of our next steps may be to actually start developing kind of residue um, standards and lists, and that's would kind of help the whole field. So you have a very good understanding as to what, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. In terms of method development, there's a lot of different areas where we can work on. Uh, one interesting thing that I've been hearing recently is that it, there is a potential that some of the media components actually interfere with some of the methods that we use to detect certain substances. Um, so that's a really good area for research, um, kind of in an academic lab. 
Um, and then there's so many questions about what's coming up, what's coming down the pipeline, and how we're going to assess the safety. So we knew there might be some new scaffold materials and new media uh, substances. Uh, we know that we might extend the culturing times, so there's a higher chance for genetic drift. Um, and I think kind of uh, the last few questions are the ones where um, I'm kind of thinking about in the next generation of products. Uh, what if we have a product that's completely different? What if we have a product that has a completely different nutritional profile than anything we've ever seen? Um, what if it's something that, doesn't, uh, that we've never eaten before? What if it's something that is completely novel and doesn't resemble any sort of meat we've ever eaten before? The reason I think that this is one of the biggest um, concerns at this point is because typically for uh, new food testing, um, animal testing is still the standard. And of course, that is something that we want to avoid. So this is something we really need to think about how we're going to really assess this new, um, new level of product. So uh, that's just basically my pitch. I think there's a lot of questions out there as to what we need to be studying, what we need to be thinking about. Um, I really think that uh, if we can bring together um, academics and regulators and researchers and industry to help provide those products, uh, I think that's one, one of the major issues in academic research is not understanding kind of uh, not having enough product to test on. Um, yeah, I really would like to bring us all together and uh, work on Safety Initiative 3.0, which um, it would be amazing if us and New Harvest could continue uh, on this path. And so if anyone is interested in working on this type of project, um, putting, your, putting research out there, supporting it, uh, please do come talk to me or any of the folks in New Harvest. Uh, we'd love to hear about interest in how we can move forward with this type of collaboration. So with that, uh, I will thank you very much. Amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna do a very quick uh, Q&A because we got started a little late and we're running a little behind and I wanna keep us on schedule so people can get coffee later and stuff. Um, very, uh, very excited to ask some questions about this. That was a really great presentation and it brought up a lot of stuff for me and for folks in the crowd as well. Um, this question is actually really interesting. Can you give us a high level sense of whether regulators and safety folks are ahead, behind, or at pace? with the current pace of technology development. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think about here in particular is, you know, often we have this perception, and I say we as like a venture capitalist and founder, um, we have this perception of um, tech advancing much faster than regulators can keep up. And sometimes there's a little bit of negativity there where it's like, are the regulators and safety people gonna be obstructionists? How much cost is that gonna add? How much time is that gonna add? And so I think there's a whole lot baked into that question, but in this community in particular, I've seen it being mostly collaborative. So I'd love a sense for how that collaboration is going. I love this question uh, because it does feel like the pace of safety is super slow and we all want it to go faster. Um, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg issue. A chicken and egg issue. Regulators uh, don't normally move forward on things until they completely understand the process, and that is the question I hear over and over again from regulators: is what do we expect coming down the pipeline? What, like, how do we develop methods if we don't know what this product is? Um, and I think that we have a real opportunity right now to kind of uh, educate regulators and actually proactively do the research and rather than wait for them to develop things because that takes a very, very long time and we know it can kind of go off on these tangents um, to actually do this. And that's why we started the regulator uh, interviews right now because they've started receiving dossiers, they understand the processes and they kind of have scientific questions. So I would say that uh, yes, we're behind in the sense that um, safety may slow us down at this point if you're ready to start authorizing. Um, however, we are ahead of what normally happens to technology. Uh, I started in Nano in 2004, and we're still developing um, safety methods now, and that is still holding up um, authorization for food and that kind of stuff. So I think this is a really exciting time, and this is something we want to get ahead of. Yeah, that's really great to hear, and that's a really helpful, that's a really helpful context and framing for, for sort of where things are, current state of things. Um, this one, oh, this is one of my favorite ones. It's about, it's about communication, right? It's about who's going to educate the public about the safety um, of cultivated meat and how. Like, who, who takes responsibility for that piece? And I think, you know, this also points at some of the, some of the discrepancy between what, what will ultimately be safety as perceived by the consumer versus what is actually determined safe by technical experts, regulatory experts, and scientists. So can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, that's a that's really interesting question. So in terms of um, what 
regulators expect are often um, science-based, and so things to like uh, looking at residues and things about kind of demonstrating the safety of your product, that can be different than what the uh, consumer perceives and what consumers expect. So for example, the cancerous thing, the hormone thing, the ga the uh, these kind of questions, they are, we know that there are ways that we can answer these types of questions, but they don't necessarily um, have to go into a safety dossier, for example, for regulatory folks. However, I think it's incumbent on us to answer those uncertainties and do the research um, in order to kind of um, uh, have the data to back up statements that things are safe. And so, yeah, I do think it is uh, a lot on us as the industry, especially if we want things to move forward, to um, do that research and do the work. Fantastic. Okay, we only... We only have time for one more question. I'm sorry to have to cut this so short because I think there's a lot of discussion, but first, you'll definitely be able to find Kim after the talk and we'll have m many more conversations over the next two days. Second, I wanted to ask you about the safety project, right? So you've got a lot of investors and experts and tech developers and customers in the crowd. What are, what are some things that, how can the community help to make sure that that comes together well? Are there things that we can do to support there? Yeah, uh, well, I think the number one thing is to uh, support New Harvest yeah. because they are the ones who bring people together. We do kind of the technical work and kind of help come up with the questions, um, but they really are the conveners. And so they're the ones when we come up, uh, when we after we talk to the regulators, we're going to have a real set of uh, research questions. We're going to have a real um, targeted things like uh, often, you know, academia, um, they want to do the research and maybe they'll go off and do things, but, you know, maybe it's not actually relevant to what, uh, what we think will be um, important for eating food. And so I think in order to do that, we need to kind of put our, our money where our mouths are and kind of be able to support this type of work. Um, this kind of collaborative work doesn't really happen um, kind of in different silos. We really need to do it as a kind of a, a collaborative project and people need to show interest um, because we need all those different aspects. So yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I think Isha told me that that the uh, the the sticker price on the on that project is actually much lower than the than the 18 millions. Although we're gonna get there, we're gonna get to the 18 million watch. But this one I think is is around 250k additional support needed for this project. So. You know, I see, I see all of you out here. I know, I know which of you have money. I'll be watching. <laughs> hey, it's me too. I'm also pointing at me. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.